Hey everyone, it's Astronomy Day today. Uh, we're going to be looking at some uh, astronomers uh, from the 18th up to the present, 18th century up to the present, uh, and we're going to start with one of the big ones, uh, Carolyn Herschel or Carolina Herschel, depending on where you're from. Uh, and there's a bunch written about her. There's the um, the Great Discoveries book. Uh, I love these books because they all have the same kind of design on the edge. When you have them all in a row, it looks really cool on the bookshelf. Uh, one of my favorite astronomy books ever is from this series, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that one. Um, more recently, Claire Brock's The Comet Sweeper uh, is Carolina Herschel, but I'm not going to talk about that one. What I'm going to talk about is Michael Hoskin. Um, so Carolyn Herschel, Priestess of the New Heavens. Uh, just because Hoskin is all about the Herschels. He's done so many books. The whole it's a it's a astronomy dynasty. Uh they're they're like the Davenports, except for, you know, astronomy instead of sickening drag. Uh the Her uh Hoskins written books about all of them. He's all over the place. And this is his book on Carolyn Herschel and her role uh as as a comet discoverer, her role in sort of taking all of the different star atlases that had different people had put together and kind of standardizing them and working out the math to get them uh, all in one place so that other researchers later on could kind of track what was happening with stars over time. Uh, and yeah, if, if you want to know about any of the Herschel clan, he's the guy to go to. Uh, so yeah, that, that's my pick for Herschel. Um, but that does look nice on a shelf. Uh, Maria Mitchell uh, was not only the first professional woman astronomer in the United States, she was the first professional astronomer in the United States, period. The first person to actually be paid for doing astronomy. Um, and uh, like a lot of things that happen um, in, in the sciences with women in science, uh, there's like a part of science that isn't deemed to be very profitable, not very professional, not very uh, high esteem. And so women can enter it without competition from men because the men are all like at the more prestigious stuff. And then as soon as they start making it into something uh, professional, making it into something esteemed, then of course the, the male, uh, in this case astronomers, move in, kick them out and make sure that they can't go to the university anymore. Uh, and that's the sort of story with Maria Mitchell. Uh, and Renee Berglund tells this story uh, in Maria Mitchell and the Sexing of Science um, about sort of her rise uh, amongst the, the Quaker community, because um, the Quakers were very sort of equal opportunity in terms of education. They have been for a very long time. Um, and then how she rose up to kind of create this little group of other women astronomy enthusiasts uh, and kind of made astronomy into something that it wasn't up until then, an actual profession, something that you did uh, as your life's work and got paid for, not something that you did as sort of an outside interest, um, you know, uh, in addition to your to your noble title or your, your actual profession. She made it a thing and then brought a bunch of other women into it, and then it started succeeding, and then within about a generation... Uh, those people are nudged out as the men kind of take over again. And this is the story of how that works. Um, so it's, it's a really neat book and it tells uh, a very familiar story. Um, but this is also a good time to bring up one of my favorite, uh, not only authors, but people, uh, Janine Atkins. Um, she writes these really cool books, um, introducing kids to different uh, astronomers and geologists and just all kind of nature, uh, um, naturalists. Uh, and Finding Wonders uh, has Maria Mitchell as one of the figures in it. And these are just these cool um, poems, sort of, uh, you know, narrative poems about different figures. Uh, and I think this one is Maria Mitchell and uh, Mary Anning. Uh, and Maria Marion. So Maria Marion, the uh, entomologist, uh, and then uh, Mary Anning, the paleontologist. So you get these three kind of neat poems about different scientists. Um, so that's one to look up if you've got kids and you want to introduce them to these figures. 
Janine Atkins has all sorts of other books. She's an incredibly inspiring person. Um, and just get all of her stuff. But this one is with Maria Mitchell. Did somebody say spectroscopy? Uh, because that's what we're going to talk about now. What a coincidence. Um, and this book was one that I took the longest time to flag down. Unraveling Starlight by Barbara Becker. Um, and it's about William and Margaret Huggins. Uh, and they are the sort of founding figures for using spectroscopy, using analysis of uh, the spectrum of starlight to say things about the composition of stars and eventually the motion of stars and such. Um, so that story of uh, not only... Because before them, if you were an astronomer, you just basically looked up at the sky and you made maps of stars and you kind of tracked how stars moved and you did things like that. You discovered comets, you discovered nebulas, and that's what you did. Um, the Hugginses uh, were all about... Well, let's take that light, let's spread it out, and let's see what else it has to tell us. Uh, and they were foundational figures in that. Um, so this is a great book about that part of astronomy. Um, it took forever because it was like 80 and $90 for the longest time. Uh, so it took a, quite a while because this is, you know, Cambridge University Press and they don't make books that people can buy. Um, so eventually I think I bit the bullet at 67 on it. Um, and it hurt a little, but, you know, for me it was worth it because it's, it's a story you don't get other places. Um, but, but yeah, that hurt for a little while, but it was worth it. Um, and then not only spectroscopy, but the, the, person telling the story about these new methods in astronomy uh, was Agnes Mary Clerk. Um, and in terms of uh, how did astronomy get popularized, how did these new ideas make their way into the public consciousness, she was a major figure in getting that to happen. Uh, and I'm really thankful that there's a book about her, and we're going to come across some of the great kind of scientific communicators uh, in this pile of books, and, and Agnes Mary Clerk was one of them. Uh, so yeah, Agnes Mary Clerk and the Rise of Astrophysics tells this story about how did people become aware of what was happening and how did she kind of connect together all these different people. She was sort of this nerve center for people across the entire world doing this new astronomy and she connected them all together and got them in touch with each other and made them aware of what each other was doing. So really important figure. Um, fulfilling a role that we don't talk about enough in science. There's a whole big story to tell with Harvard, uh, and in the early 20th century, um, women played a big role in the uh, Harvard Observatory, uh, and there are just massive amounts of data that they collected, and then uh, how these different women astronomers used these massive amounts of data to discover some really important things about how the universe works. Um, so this was the other great discoveries book that I that I like. Um, so Miss Levitt's Stars. I don't know if it's Miss Levitt's Stars or if it's Levitt. I, if somebody knows for sure, I just pronounce it both ways every single time. Um, but uh, this is George Johnson's account. Uh, so she was uh, the person who came up with a way of using variable stars uh, as a way of measuring relative distances between objects in the night sky. Um, so effectively, her work uh, in using um, the, the rate of variation as a way of correlating distance um, was one which was picked up later on as a way of measuring the actual size of the universe. And this is the story of her and then how her data and her ideas got picked up uh, and were employed by people like Hubble to figure out what the size of the universe is. Uh, so she was working at Harvard. Um, and at the same time, you had Annie Jump Cannon, uh, who was working at Harvard. And... Uh, You'll notice this book is kind of it's called In the Footsteps of Columbus, um, which is a book that Annie Jump Cannon wrote, uh, which doesn't have as much to do with astronomy, but it's kind of the only place that you'll go, you'll get 
outside of a, uh, you know, just sort of a book on the history of astronomy that has maybe a paragraph about her, uh, it has a little biography of Annie Jump Cannon, uh, and she was one of the people involved in the, the Draper catalog, which cataloged thousands and thousands and thousands of stars. She is this iron woman of star cataloging. Um, and yeah, uh, not mentioned nearly enough. You have books about Leave It or Leave It. Uh, you have books about our next person, who is also a major star cataloger. And she's just kind of there in the middle. And this is kind of one of the only places you can go to get her story, is in this little book that she wrote, uh, which has this nice biography attached to it. Now, the major figure uh, coming out of Harvard uh, is Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin. Uh, and she's one that a lot of people know because she's the one who controversially comes out and says, you know what? Uh, I'm using these new techniques that are coming out, uh, these new methods of analyzing uh, uh, spectral data and temperature data in particular. And it seems to me that stars are made very much of hydrogen. Uh, stars are mainly hydrogen, because uh, the theory before that was that stars were made up of basically the same percent of stuff that we have on Earth. So whatever the percent of the elements is on Earth, that should be the same as the percent of elements in a star, because the Earth came from stars, so it should have the same thing. Um, and she actually does the data, uh, does the calculations, and says, nope, it's mainly hydrogen, and most stars are mainly hydrogen, um, the universe is overwhelmingly hydrogen and, uh, is, is made to, you know, suppress the data at first, um, until a male astronomer comes out with a similar study and then people are like, ah, I think the universe is mainly hydrogen. Um, so three different times in her career she has to, um, suppress ideas that ultimately turned out to be right. So this book, um, it's her autobiography, her actually writing about her experiences, um, along with some other material. Um, I believe Catherine Haramundanis is her daughter, as I recall. It's been a while ago. A more responsible person would have checked before gabbing on about it. Um, but, uh, it's a really valuable one for, again, a rare opportunity of somebody actually talking about themselves. Uh, then just recently, um, Donovan Moore, this was just this year, came out with What Stars Are Made Of, uh, which is a very, this is what she did title. Um, and I just got this in my hands, like literally last week. So I haven't had a chance to read it, but it is out there as a secondary option in your Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin library. Next, we're going to look at three figures who are kind of off the beaten track a little bit. Um, these books came out, uh, and they were, you know, of interest to people in those particular parts of astronomy. Well, one and a couple of them are. Um, but th they are off the beaten track, but have really cool stories to tell. Uh, and Making Waves, uh, which is a book about Ruby Payne Scott, who was an Australian uh, radio astronomer. Um, it's a really neat story. Uh, and she's sort of famous as one of the first people, um, arguably, we'll say one of the first and get into the details later, uh, to point a, um, to do radio astronomy at the sun, in order, other words, to point a radio array at the sun, uh, and use it to do sort of solar analysis, um, which started, um, producing results very quickly and got a lot of other people interested in this, um, in this idea. Because she, along with a lot of other people in Australia during World War II, uh, was involved with radar work because they were concerned about, oh, the Japanese army seems to be getting kind of close. We should really up our radar game. Um, and so she was involved in that. There were other women who were involved in this work to uh, develop radar uh, defenses in Australia. And then they're like, well, we just developed all this expertise in radar and developing these radar sets. Uh, the war is over. What are we going to do? Well, let's point it at the sun and see what we can do with that. And it turns out you can do some really interesting things. So Making Waves is a, is a cool book about that sort of evolution uh, and her role in that, um, which should be talked about more. Um, next, in terms of, uh, again, the great communicators... Um, we talked in the math video about Mary Somerville, who was one of the great 
communicators of math and got lots of people excited about not only math, but lots of science. Um, Clerk, who we just talked about bringing this new type of astrophysics to the world. Uh, and I think Helen Sawyer Hogg is somebody who really does not get mentioned. Uh, when you think about people in the 20th century who communicated astronomy to the world, uh, you think, you know, your Carl Sagan's, your Neil deGrasse Tyson's, but Helen Sawyer Hogg was, you know, the form uh, that other people followed later on. She was a, a person who was interested in, and you can tell by the title of her book, The Stars Belong to Everyone, uh, in bringing astronomy to your backyard, uh, to getting everybody interested in what was out there in the night sky. Um, just a really neat, neat person um, and, and a, a foundational figure in science communication and astronomy communication. Um, and her books are still just, just fun and charming and, and full of this wide-eyed enthusiasm for what's out there. Uh, and we can all use that. Uh, so pick up her books. They're, they're just beautiful. Um, and then a, a tragic book. Uh, so this is My Daughter Beatrice, a personal memoir of Dr. Beatrice Tinsley, astronomer. And there's nothing sadder uh, than having to write a memoir of your daughter who passed before you did. Um, it's, it's a really tragic thing. Um, and so this is, this is Edward Hill writing about Beatrice Tinsley. She was um, a major figure in... Um, a sort of evol in galactic evolution, basically. Um, so, you know, prior to her, uh, you had this very static view of what galaxies were, that they were there and they were generally uh, static, uh, sort of uninteresting objects. And she was a major person in bringing together her knowledge of mathematics and physics and chemistry and everything in one place to try and get a much more dynamic view of what galaxies were. <clears throat> and uh, lots of people... Um, collaborated with her and, and grew interested in her work to create the sort of more modern, uh, you know, galaxies interacting with each other, uh, galaxies growing old, and the sort of lifespan of a galaxy. Um, and, you know, she started that off, uh, and she only lived, I think, to about 40 years old. Um, so it's just one of those tragic things, what more might she have done? Um, but at least we have this, this book um, from somebody who knew her. Um, and I wish it were in just constant print, but you're going to have to look at, for it at a used bookstore. Um, or on this thing called the internet, which I hear you can also get books on. Um, so yeah, check it out. And then we step into more living memory. Um, and Vera Rubin, um, Bright Galaxies, Dark Matters, uh, so sort of famous as the person who discovered that, um, there's something wrong with our notions about how fast uh, objects should spin around the centers of the galaxies. These things aren't quite working out uh, and theorize the existence of dark matter, uh, that there's something else out there uh, that's throwing off our calculations, but that isn't readily observable. Um, and, uh, you know, this is... Uh, collection of her writings um, about how she came to these ideas, how they modif how she modified them over time. Um, and it's, it's, you know, a heartening example of, again, an astronomer actually telling uh, parts of their life and parts of their work uh, personally. Um, and yeah, we, we don't have enough of those. Luckily, uh, there's another one coming up here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a neat one. Um, and, you know, we lost her recent-ish. Uh, so, you know, it's just worth time to pick it up and kind of just remember what she did. Um, oh, I can't decide. I put these in this order, but now I'm doubting it at the last moment. Uh, let's do this one. Um, so, uh, Nancy Roman. There is not a book about Nancy Roman by herself, which is too bad because she's awesome. Um, but you can get a large part of her story in Robert Zimmerman's, Zimmerman's The Universe in a Mirror, uh, which is a book about the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, which she was instrumental uh, in realizing. Uh, so she was the person who kind of had to do this thankless task of getting 
all these different astronomers who wanted all had all these different visions of what the Hubble t Space Telescope should be, what it should do, um, and she was the one who saw this whole process through to reality to create this, you know, outstanding and wonderful um, device, uh, uh, tool for measuring uh, the, the universe. Um, so she is a prominent figure in this one. I hope that we get a full treatment of Nancy Roman at some point, but this will do for the time being. And um, speaking of going out there in the universe, uh, Jill Tarter making contact. Um, and Tarter contact, that sounds familiar. Yeah, uh, so she is, you know, widely known as the person that um, the Carl Sagan's novel Contact is sort of based off of, uh, that Jill Tarter's search for um, extraterrestrial life um, and her scraping together funding to try and keep these efforts going um, and to, you know, per developed expertise in different forms of radio communication and radio arrays uh, and what are the different ways that we could conceivably pick up on these signals. Um, that story is all told here uh, as well as the sort of, you know, shifting political fortunes of that movement. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a really really interesting account of that whole attempt. Um, so yeah, just, just worth, worth a read, uh, in terms of, uh, even if, if you think search for extraterrestrial intelligence is never going to get anywhere, uh, if you really believe in it, either way, just a story about how do you get science done. If you have an interesting and new, slightly off the beaten path scientific idea, and you want to get it done in the modern uh, climate, how does that happen? Um, it's a very interesting account for that. Uh, so there we go. Uh, if you were like, my favorite astronomer astronaut's not on here, don't worry, we're going to have a whole thing on astronauts later. Uh, but those are some just, uh, it's hard to say, but just about all of those are some of my favorites. I love books about astronomers, uh, and each one of those, it's like, you know, what's the universe made of? What's the size of the universe? These fundamental questions, and behind almost all of them, you have a, a woman astronomer uh, unlocking some of those secrets. So it's a really neat journey to go on. Uh, so I uh, hope you enjoyed that, and we'll be back with more stuff later. See you then. <laughs>